Welcome to the second day of the Memorial Conference for Robert Brown. Um, to kick off the morning sessions, we have Malcolm Perry, who will talk about BMS symmetry, scattering, and black holes. Well, thank you, Edward, for the introduction. And I must thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me. Uh, what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing with Andy Strominger in Harvard, two of his students, Daniel Kapek and Anna Reclariu, um, and Stephen Hawking in Cambridge. What we've been concerned with is whether or not uh, there is any progress to be made in the black hole information paradox. And really, uh, there's something which is new that I'd like to share with you. And it really relates to symmetries, in this particular case, asymptotic symmetries, and symmetry breaking. Uh, rather than deal with complications of gravitation, most of my talk will be about what happens in electrodynamics. And uh, the gravitational case is very similar, except vastly more complicated from an algebraic point of view. So we'll do things in electrodynamics mainly. Um, and what I want to do is to start off with a discussion of uh, the infinite number of conserved charges in electrodynamics. So I want to start with a picture of Minkowski space. Um, I will use the Penrose way of describing Minkowski space, which is to draw a diagram that looks a little bit like this. If you go to infinity in a time-like way, t going to infinity but r fixed, then you'll end up at a place called uh, future time-like infinity, similarly in the past. If you go to infinity in a space-like way, you end up at space-like infinity, i0, a point over here. There is what happens if you go to r equals infinity and keep t finite. That's usually where you think of doing asymptotic analysis. But it's not a good place to be in relativity, because many of the things we're interested in, like the electromagnetic field and the gravitational field, involve massless particles. And there, one goes to if you want to get away from some central region, you go to scry plus or scry minus. And this is really the region that light rays end up in. You want to think of a nice coordinates on scry plus and scry minus, future and past null infinity. Going in this direction, there will be a retarded time coordinate u. And on scry minus, there will be an advanced time coordinate v which runs from minus infinity to plus infinity and takes you up and down scry. So if you are looking at a system, say, at the origin or close to the origin here, then you will be up here looking at it from a remote distance. That's where light rays will uh, emerge or uh, where any massless particle will emerge. So that's the basic setup that we're interested in. Of course. You can think of this as being the celestial sphere, or this as being the celestial sphere. And so if you just take a section of scry, plus or minus, this will be a two-sphere. And you can construct coordinates on the two-sphere. I will use complex coordinates z, which are related to polar coordinates by z equals cot half theta e to the i phi. But of course, there are many other ways of doing this. One of the remarkable things about uh, electromagnetism is a result that's originally due to Christodoulou and Kleinemann. They were interested in the stability of Minkowski space and wrote a rather impenetrable 1,000-page book on the subject. But they proved a very important theorem in the middle of this concerning the behavior of Maxwell fields at points here. This is the future end point of scry minus. This is the past end point of scry plus. You might say, well, it looks like they're somehow joined to I0. But I0, space-like infinity, is sort of different. And in this way of thinking about it is a singular point. We really don't want to think about what happens at space-like infinity. 
So what Christodoulou and Kleinemann proved was the following result, which in retrospect is quite surprising. What they did was they looked at the limit as r goes to infinity of the um, r squared times the electromagnetic field at this point here, the past end point of scry minus, sorry, scry plus. It will be a function of z. So this is at scry plus in the remote past. So the retarded time coordinate is equal to minus infinity. What they showed was that this was equal to the limit as r goes to infinity, r squared fab of p of z, uh, and this is evaluated on scry minus, in the limit as the advanced time coordinate goes to plus infinity. p of z is the point antipodal on the sphere to z. So p is the antipodal map. So the thing that's surprising about this result is that it's equivalent to an infinite number of conservation laws for electromagnetism. One way you can think about this is to say that it's a conservation of charge, but at every angle on the sphere, not just integrated over the entire sphere. Another way of saying it is to take these two points and write an integral formula for the charge. So I'm going to define a charge Q plus associated with some field of Psylon. This is going to be equal to the integral of a Psylon times star of F, F being the electromagnetic field strength 2 form. And this will be evaluated at U equals minus infinity on scry plus. This, of course, will be integrated over Z. What Christodoulou and Kleinemann proved was that this was equal to a charge Q minus, which is the integral of epsilon star F of PZ integrated on scry minus as V goes to plus infinity. And the deal here is that epsilon can be absolutely any spherical harmonic you're interested in. So these are the infinite number of conservation laws. In this particular case, what it tells you is that the charge here is equal to the charge here. So it's a map between what happens in the remote past on scry minus and what happens in the remote future on scry plus. So this is one way of writing it. But there's a second way of writing it, which is um, in many ways rather more useful, and that's to write it as a flux integral. And if you want to write a flux integral, you just basically use Gauss's theorem and let's apply Gauss's theorem to this picture. So you can describe not just a charge at this point here, but you could de describe a charge at this point here, where u equals, say, u0, 
whatever I do on scry plus, you can do on scry minus. So what is q at zero, u0? Zero? Well, it's going to be whatever q plus was originally at u equals minus infinity plus just apply Gauss's theorem to what's written above and you'll get two terms d epsilon star f and that will be integrated over a region of scry plus between here and here so there's a u integral involved plus epsilon d star f but from Maxwell's equations, d star f is just equal to the electric current. So what this is telling you is that the charge difference is equal to a term that involves the moment of some electric current. So this represents, if you like, charged particles passing through infinity. The first term is a little bit different. What this really corresponds to is what is usually called the soft photon term. Although it's not completely obvious from this formulation of it, what it represents is the passage of zero energy photons through scry plus see a little bit better what this is really about, perhaps the simplest thing to do is to ask yourself, does this uh, have the correct properties, does this charge have the correct properties that you'd expect of it? So what you can do is to evaluate what one might like to call the Poisson bracket of the charge with electromagnetic field potential. So what you can do is to take the bracket. Since this is a gauge theory, we should really be talking about the Dirac bracket. Um, so you want to compute Q epsilon. Uh, and that can happen at any instant of retarded time with the transverse Uh, components of the electromagnetic pot field potential. And if this charge is really a charge, then what it should do is to generate a gauge transformation. And that's exactly what it does. It simply gives you d of epsilon. So that shows you that epsilon acts as something which is a pure gauge transformation. But you'll notice that this gauge transformation is not something which vanishes at infinity. It's a large gauge transformation. <coughs> and is not something that factors out of the path integral uh, when you gauge fix things in the usual way. So what this charge does is indeed generate a particular kind of gauge transformation. If you have a large gauge transformation, it generally indicates a degeneracy in the theory. And that's what this signals. It signals that there really is uh, a degeneracy of the vacuum. So that's really how you want to think of that. So far, everything that we have done is classical, but we can turn this into a quantum uh, argument by considering some further properties of uh, scattering. So what I want to do is to consider some scattering processes that will allow us to understand precisely what this is about. Let's first of all rewrite 
uh, Christodoulou and Kleinemann's result in terms of the S matrix. Um, the black pen for this. So what they would say is that out S Q epsilon Uh, let's write it the other way around. Q epsilon plus S minus S Q epsilon minus in is equal to zero. That's the quantum mechanical version of the Christodou and, Lou and Kleinemann result. Let's consider what this means. Let's, first of all, construct a measure of soft photons. So let's define an operator n hat, which is equal to the integral over all uh, a retarded time at scry plus of f u z. This is a measure of the number of zero energy photons. You can see that you're integrating du over f of uz, there's no e to the i omega u, so this selects out the things with zero energy. And this operator will, of course, depend on z, where you are on the sphere at infinity. We should give ourselves a plus here, because this represents outgoing states. <coughs> Similarly, there's an n z z minus, the integral over advanced time, f u z, uh, defined on scry minus. So this is outgoing, and this is ingoing. So this object is a measure of the amount of zero energy photons in some particular state. Now let's look at the Christodoulou and Kleinemann result in quantum language. We take this thing and we ask ourselves what it is. The easiest way to do it is just to simply write out uh, a version of our integral formula which reads now nz plus um, let's take one extra step. Let's suppose that we're dealing with states that are eigenstates of nz. So there will be a soft part, and then there'll be a hard part of this thing. And nz hat acting on this will just be nz soft hard meaning that these things should be regarded as a function of nz. Now let's write out what this thing really means. It says that nz plus, for outgoing, minus nz minus, minus an object, which I call omega, acting on out s in, must be equal to 0. This thing corresponds to the soft component but there's going to be a hard component which you can actually evaluate. You evaluate that from the integral flux formula that we had earlier, and you'll discover that omega is equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi times the sum of k um, outgoing particles of qk times 1 over z minus zk. Qk is the charge of the kth particle that's outgoing. Z, I remind you, are the stereographic coordinates on the two-sphere. And zk just labels where the kth particle is going. Minus 1 over 4 pi, sum over k prime, qk prime, 1 over z minus zk prime. And that's omega. 
So this only depends on the hard particles. So what does this formula tell you? The result is somewhat surprising. It tells you that there's, of course, a conservation law, because either this thing has got to vanish, or this thing has got to vanish. But it proves that the vacuum is not unique for the following reason. Suppose you thought the vacuum was unique, meaning there was a unique zero energy state. That would tell you that nz plus would be equal to nz minus. If you thought that was true, then this would be equal to this. But omega, of course, is anything you want, because you could decide to scatter any number of particles you want in any, any different number of different ways. So you would lead to come to the conclusion that out s in was equal to 0, which, of course, doesn't seem like the right kind of thing to have for physical theory. In actual fact, that is what you usually do. The fact that the S matrix element vanishes is a sign of the infrared divergence that you find in quantum electrodynamics. In quantum electrodynamics, it's well known that if you do not, so if you fix the number of outgoing photons, there is an infrared divergence as uh, the momentum of the outgoing particle goes to zero. When you exponentiate up those quantities, you will discover that it results in the S matrix being equal to zero. So in actual fact, that is precisely the right answer. But of course, that's one way in which you can do electrodynamics. You can simply say, well, I'm not going to observe these particles. I'm going to compute inclusive cross-sections and not worry about it. But rather more fundamentally, what it's telling you is that there's some inconsistency unless you recognize the fact that the number of soft particles is not something that you can ignore safely. So what one should do is to say that nz plus minus nz minus is equal to omega. Then you can have uh, your S matrix not being equal to zero. So if you keep track of the number of soft particles, then you can have some result like this. So what is the story then with infrared divergences in this picture? Well, the answer is really very simple. The reason that you encounter an infrared divergence if you do not take care of soft particles is simply that you're using uh, states in your theory that are not gauge invariant. So if you look at the usual Feynman perturbation rules, you would say, oh, well, take a charged particle. It's described by a field phi of x. That acting on the vacuum corresponds to the particle at the point x in space-time. The problem is this is not gauge invariant. You need to make this object gauge invariant if you want to make gauge invariant computational results. So the way, easy way to do this is to simply say, here is a gauge invariant version of this operator. So this is gauge invariant. provided uh, del A C A of x is delta of x minus x prime. I guess I should write the prime there. Of course, C under those circumstances is not uniquely specified. And the different Cs that you can construct correspond to different ways of modifying this uh, operator phi. 
as you can see, if this thing acts on the vacuum, what it represents is some coherent state of soft photons, as well as the object phi of x, whatever charged particle that you have. So this represents a gauge invariant operator and corresponds to the particle at x. dressed by a coherent state of soft particles. And to some extent, what that coherent state is, is up to you. If you could measure these soft particles, then of course there would be a precise description of what C has to be. So these will be the gauge invariant observables. And if you look at these things, then if you try to compute scattering amplitudes using these as your states, you will find things which are infrared finite. So that is, in some sense, a more logical way of doing uh, computation of the scattering amplitudes. There's a particular class which are rather useful, called the fadiev coolish states. And they have recently uh, been used. So these are special cases. There have been some recent explicit uh, computations by Akuri, showing that these are precisely the right things to use. I won't go into the details of what these fadiev coolish states are, but this enables you to be able to get rid of the infrared divergences of electrodynamics. So what does this mean? Well, in terms of symmetry breaking, what's happened is that the vacuum was infinitely degenerate. That degeneracy is broken by introducing these soft photons. So the vacuum was infinitely dege degenerate. Soft photons break that degeneracy. And so you'd be tempted to say, correctly, that the photon is therefore the Nambu-Goldstone boson of this symmetry. So that's the outcome of this particular analysis. Um, so that's a sort of convenient place to stop worrying about uh, scattering in electrodynamics. There's a very similar story for gravitation, but the principal difference is the complication of the algebra. So I'm not going to uh, discuss that. What has this got to do with black hole physics? or the information paradox. Well, let me remind you of a basic result in black hole physics. The basic result is the no-hair theorem.
which basically says the geometry of a black hole is completely determined by three objects. It's mass, m, it's angular momentum, j, and it's electric charge, q. And if that's all there is to it, if that's really what gives rise to the Hawking paradox, the information paradox. Because it's saying that all black holes are completely indistinguishable from each other, and therefore they're independent of the nature of their formation. Now let's examine that in the context of what we've just discovered. Let's look at the Penrose diagram for a black hole. So uh, let's look at an internal black hole to start with. There is a nicely defined scry minus down here. There is a well-behaved scry plus up here. But at some point, an event horizon forms, a surface that looks like this, another null surface, which I'll label by H. And sitting inside, there is a singularity which represents the boundary of space-time. Now let's ask ourselves, what do Christodou and Kleinemann tell us about this? Let's suppose that nothing is happening in the infinite past, or indeed up here. So it tells us if we look at a surface like this, we can use that to determine about Q minus epsilon. Then they show that the fields here are related to fields here. And now let's look at what happens in the future. If we want to define Q plus in the future, we have to construct a surface that looks like this to define Q epsilon plus. It's not just scry plus, but also the horizon. This shows that the black hole will have to have uh, these soft charges Q. Otherwise, you could not have conservation. So these soft charges are, in some sense, a counterexample to the no-hair theorems. They tell you that if you have a black hole, there will be a collection of soft charges that goes with it. That may or may not be uh, a clue as to how to go around resolving the information paradox. So in the last few minutes, let me describe uh, three possible conjectures. Not just scry plus, but if you scry plus and the horizon, the union of the two, it's got to cover. It's got to be a, a future Cauchy surface. Otherwise, you can't describe conservation. We heard a little bit earlier about statistical mechanics. Black holes have entropy. of S is equal to a quarter of the area of the event horizon. But of course, it would be nice to have some kind of Boltzmann interpretation of what that is, in which you write the partition function as uh, Z is the sum over states of E to the minus beta energy of the states. So it would be nice if, using these charges, you could derive the black hole entropy. <coughs> so that's conjecture one. If you could, 
you would have gone a long way towards solving the information paradox. This is something which is currently under investigation. And uh, the fact that I haven't told you how to do that means that we don't know how to do it yet, although we have some ideas. Conjecture two concerns a black hole which evaporates. So let's draw a Penrose diagram of that. There is a well-defined scry plus, a well-defined scry minus, a singularity here. In this situation, what you see is some collapsing matter giving rise to the black hole. Here, you have the horizon. And what you will see, what you know that you see, is Hawking radiation coming out here. Hawking radiation is entirely thermal. So you can say that Hawking radiation Well, Hawking radiation is really particles with energy. So this corresponds to hard particles. So it will be the hard part of any state. And you know this is a mixed state. So the second conjecture is that in actual fact, you can purify this state. Well, of course, we should put this with a question mark. That is to say that the product of the hard particles in the Hawking radiation times soft, which don't show up in the Hawking process because you don't consider states which are dressed, that this object is a pure state. That's harder to prove, and we are not currently investigating that. Let me finish with a third conjecture. Let's consider any observer. So here is a world line of some observer. You can construct its past light cone. It looks something like this. you can construct soft charges on that surface. Rather than looking at scry or H, the horizon of a black hole, where everyone will agree on what null surface you're actually interested in, here, the boundary of the past light cone is a place where you can define these charges. So you can define the charges on that surface. And in our more outrageous moments, we sort of think that that's the way in which you should really think of holography. So that, I think, is the place to stop. But let me add one thing. This cannot be as resolution to the information paradox in a theory in which there are global symmetries. It can only possibly work if all symmetries are gauge symmetries. So that in, can best be described as a plea for uh, a better understanding of string theory and what it has to do with black hole physics for the simple reason that string theory is the only theory that we know of where all symmetries are gauge symmetries. So thank you for listening. Any questions?
Well, Hawking quanta are emitted. There should be also quanta which stays inside black hole and which carry negative energy with respect to uh, infinity outside of black hole, right? Because uh, yeah. there should be negative flux of radiation. Uh, let me draw that on the picture. Right, you. Okay. Okay. So the thing that you're talking about. Radiation there, yes. then there must be something in going there. No, it's in going, but actually, uh, negative energy. Uh, this will have negative energy because it's making the black hole evaporate. No, these have positive energy because they are outside horizon. Negative energy should move along horizon from inside, side, from inside, uh, inside black hole. Side. Yes, yeah. because there should be flux of negative quanta. If quanta was outside the hole, then by definition... Okay. So here is, one, here is one way in which you can think about the Hawking process. These things have negative energy. You know that it makes the area of the event horizon decrease. No, I would think that actually negative energy quanta never come outside horizon, and this is the reason why I'm always surprised, because you can do the following thing. You can just consider entangled entropy between this negative energy quanta and positive energy quanta. Negative energy quanta disappear in singularity. Yeah, they disappear into the singularity. Yeah, no so, but that. what you expect after that, how, for instance, information, the about that, them can be recovered outside of the The question that you're asking relates to uh, conjecture two. So, it, in some sense, it's a version of the no cloning theorem. You have some initial state here where everything appears to disappear into the singularity. It's gone from our universe. Okay. It falls off the boundary of space-time. At least that's what happens in classical physics. Yes. What you're basically asking about is how the information in these hard particles gets transferred to sufficient soft information on the horizon, charges which, which characterize the black hole, how, there could be, how this could happen in a sufficient amount to enable you to reconstruct the initial state. How? Now, that, of course, is uh, the content of conjecture two, and I have no clear understanding of how to deal with conjecture two at the moment. No, but Michael, you agree perhaps with me. If I will take book, for instance, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, with more content, throw in the black hole, yes. then it will cross horizon during very short time. Yes. And then you want to tell me that during this short time, all the information will be imprinted somehow on the vacuum? If that, if that does not happen, then there will be a violation of unitarity in this process. But I'm not telling you how to do it. Right, right. I have no idea how to do it. Yeah. What I am telling you is that the no-hair theorems do not work, and the no-hair theorems are the basis, fundamental origin of what the information paradox is. There is an infinite amount of hair that you could have here, but we have no idea as to how the information that falls in is encoded into this hair, or at least we do not at the moment. Right, but we discussed it already for 20 years, right? No. Or more. 43 60. years. 43 years, right? Okay, we changing things on one way, the other way, etc. And is there really paradox or not? Because if I will leave, for instance, small remnants, then I can always draw a complete hypersurface where there will be full unitarity. Oh, what but is then it? small remnants are, have their own problems because you have to hide an arbitrary large amount of information in an arbitrary small volume. Yes, but... You will say the interior it has infinite volume and so it's fine. But right, it's first of all, as a second thing, after this, they could follow, for instance, but the new universe. You will hide there. It you, will be in absolute future. Um, perhaps we could continue the yes, discussion well, during yeah, coffee break. So, uh, what I think this illustrates is that this is an interesting problem. <laughs> yes, indeed. Last time, now, can we go? Oh. Oh. Yeah, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I came in a little bit late. So, I missed the opening remarks about uh, Kleinem and Christodoulou papers. Uh, am I right in getting the hard part of their analysis is to do with the, when things, you say, things vanish at infinity, the question is, how, how do they vanish? What sort of order? And the analysis of that is very delicate. I'm guessing that's what they were doing. That is indeed what they were doing. So exactly. the, problem, the problem is uh, the following, in sort of more technical language. Uh, let's suppose that uh, space-time is 
asymptotically simple in the sense of Penrose. And we look close to what happens at scry plus, scry minus, and I0. The problem is that in compactified space-time, I0 is a singular point. And so that means that any exploration of the fields in this region is going to depend very crucially on the behavior well, you've got to worry about what happens at I0. Essentially, you've got to remove, you've got to control the nature of anything singular coming out of I0. And so their analysis is a very careful analysis of that. And that enables them to describe uh, the fields in a region which I think basically looks like that. And that's how they get things under control. Can I thank you for clarifying what I suspected? Uh, can I suggest? very tentatively, the information paradox is essentially an insoluble problem. In uh, the sense of logicians, I will, and I'll refer to that in my talk, Okay. I think I, the reason you haven't solved it is that it is an insoluble problem. An well, insoluble problem means, of course, very technical things to logicians. You need logicians to help you, and that's why it's been so hard. You need some logicians here. The, the, the problem with that is that despite that, uh, of course, maybe this is hinges on what is meant by the word soluble in this particular case, Yes. is that we know that quantum mechanics works. Up if, to a point. Well. Up to a point. It's true that it's only been tested up Einstein to a point. Einstein said quantum mechanics is only valid up to a point. And I believe Einstein. Who do you believe? Um, uh, I was saying verified as far as we know as an experimental statement. So there's no conflict there. No, if, no. But if quantum mechanics... It, well, experiments can only go so far. You can't do experiments to infinity. That's true. And indeed, in this particular case, there is some arbitrariness because how you choose the dressing function, C, is an arbitrary thing. And so there's an issue there which may have something to do with what you're suggesting. Exactly. Um, Thank you for agreeing with me. Uh, I don't disagree yet. <laughs> All right. that's I, I, may, I may disagree later, but I don't disagree now. Good. Let's, okay. let's break on that I, point. Thank you. In the interest of time, I think we better move the discussion to the coffee break. Uh, let's thank Malcolm again for a very interesting talk.